So if you were to map the entire world, how many people would it take? Or some HR people are saying, what kind of people would it take? So let's look at that. How, what kind of people would it take to map the world? So in order to figure this out, let's look at the people who mapped the world uh, the first time, the, when we were at the cusp of ma uh, creating the first, first complete map of the world. This is a map of the, in the late 16th century. And you see a lot of familiar shapes, like Indonesia, India, all mapped. But you also see a couple of weird things in the upper right corner. These are the areas that haven't been mapped yet. So they heard some rumors that they're big monsters and so on. So the cartographer said, here be dragons. <laughs> Pay attention, don't go there. <laughs> or be adventurous and go there. And uh, there were other rumors. A lot of those maps were based on rumors. Uh, like if you look at the lower corner, there's something called beach. That's based on the rumor by, uh, that Marco Polo heard and brought back. And that turns out to be Australia. That's a bit, no, you know, that's the area. So uh, the Dutch were the first to really go down there and explore. So this is in the early 17th century map of the Dutch East India Trading Company. And you saw they went down there and found something huge. They found something that starts at the west coast of Australia and has, apparently extends down to Tasmania and the west coast of southern New Zealand and goes up to Papua New Guinea. So these, uh, these early explorers were people who went and mapped the world. And they were also the only users of their maps. Every time they went there, they found some new stuff, they brought it back, and the maps were updated. So the users of the maps were the uh, creators of the maps. And if you look at what they did, they, they did it for the purpose there was map making per se. They wanted to go and trade, um, find other trading posts, find other passages that were maybe f faster. So what they noted, you will see a more practical thing. So you see the names of the landscape here. Uh, Sharks Bay, Salt River, uh, Freshwater Pine Pit, Steep Shore, or Rocky Shore, things like that. And the, here in the lower corner, Swan, that's where Perth will later be. So the swans were there before. Uh, and uh, across the pond, you see something called Rottnest Island, which is actually for Dutch Rattenest. But uh, th these were the little tiny kangaroos, about cat-sized. But they saw them from, they didn't go aboard. They just saw the many rats there and called it, this is a Rottnest, and they go there. Uh, so these were the things they, they called. This name actually stuck, and it's a popular holiday destination now, despite the name. And well, a bit later, the map already looked like this which looks almost like the map today, uh, except for there's nothing inland here. So they, they mapped the coasts, but then the next phase of the exploration was going inside the country. And here's a map of uh, Africa in 1787, a uh, map of the English colonies. And you see there's still many gaps. But what's also interesting about this map is that it tells a, bit, a few stories, or they tell what, what they haven't discovered yet. So in the middle, there's an annotation like this. This lake is said to extend further and broader to the north. And indeed, it does. It's Lake Victoria. Uh, <laughs> they haven't just found it yet. Uh, another annotation here is, uh, tells from uh, early adventures the Portuguese had when they tried to make a calling there. Apparently, the original inhabitants didn't like that and cut them into small pieces. Um, so that was a warning sign that uh, was kept there. You can also tell that someone else would probably draw a very different map with very different stories. And so. Time passed, the, those gaps got closed, more and more data was collected. And uh, at the beginning, the maps were trade secrets. Like, indeed, the Portuguese were, for many centuries, the only people who knew how to travel to Java. And then uh, the Dutch stole the maps and figured out how to get there too, and so on. But in, in the, over the course of time, they weren't worth keeping secret anymore. It was actually more fruitful to have people know how to get to places, to do more trading, and so on. And, and maps became more and more available until the beginning of the 20th century when cars came up and using maps to do long distance navigation is something that now most of us grew up with. Uh, so here's the early road map uh, of 1918 uh, around Detroit where all the cars were made. Um, and you see there's a lot of garages marked on the map. That's because the cars kept breaking down. And uh, when, I, when I did research for this talk, one thing I was really delighted to find was the first version of Street View. So uh, this is uh, from the 1940s, uh, 1940, the Hamilton Road Guide. And it actually has an actual photo of each turn you have to take. So, so we can't patent that one anymore, I guess. But um, so, so time passed, and eventually uh, the internet came up, and so on. And you heard the story. And Google launched this. Uh, we just discovered Great Britain. Uh, <laughs> 
So, so, so the maps then were, the, the beginning maps, uh, Google didn't get their own data. We just bought it from data providers piece by piece. Uh, maybe we should have put some dragons there or maybe, I don't know, ninjas and pirates or something. But um, very quickly after that, we bought a bit more data, and then the map looked like this. And then it turns out if you buy data that is from data providers that are not uh, that, whose data isn't used by that many people, now you suddenly show it to hundreds of millions of people, you get in trouble sometimes. So one incident is we had a little tiny error in the border, and then we had these headlines that sounded like Google went and like invaded a town, and Chile was asking for it back. Um, so luckily, it was just a little data error. But a couple of years later, there was an actual little in invasion that was blamed on Google Maps. Like the commander of a Nicaraguan group said, well, he looked on the map, and that looked like Nicaragua. So, uh, well, um, we are, we're now all the borders that we know of, uh, we try to make them as accurate as possible in getting the data. Uh, but we also, uh, when they're a bit contentious, like here's a, a line in uh, Kashmir, where we just put, instead of saying this is belongs to this country, we put the contracts there and do stuff like that. Now, speaking of Kashmir and that entire subcontinent, it turns out uh, that was still pretty blank on our map. We had the major cities but, and the major roads, but not much more. So uh, it wasn't a very useful map. And it was very hard to get the data. So this approach of going out and buying data has some limits. There's either no data, or it's not digital, or whoever has it doesn't want to sell it to us. And so we figured, hmm, how do we get this map to be less white? And we thought back to the explorers and said, well, there's, those were people who used the map were also the people who created the map. So maybe we should go to our users and ask them to map things. And so we did that. We created a site called MapMaker. And here you see a, a city, Madurai, in uh, the south of India. It's actually one of the longest continuously inhabited areas um, of humanity. And here you see it being mapped in about six months. So much faster by our users. And now you can go online uh, and to, a side, uh, to the map maker side, and you can see how people are mapping it live. So this is real time, how people go around and create roads. They don't quite draw that fast. That's a little bit accelerated. But, but you see all these users. So we wanted to know who are these users. And then we went uh, and made some conferences and invited the, the, the users who did most of the edits and get to know them. It was really quite interesting. Like the guy in the upper left corner is a surgeon during the day. And so in the evening, to relax, he goes and draws a little bit of maps. <laughs> so so <laughs> um, there's other projects. Uh, most famously, OpenStreetMap. Uh, other project that has uh, a similar approach in having users map the world. Their uh, motivation, so every mapper has their motivation. Their motivation is to create free data so that uh, everyone can access this data and there's no, no license fees that you have to pay and so on. Um, back home, we tried a new approach of mapping uh, or basically getting data collection, which is the famous Street View. It recently had its first cameo exp um, appearance in a TV series. This is burn notice, and it just drove on the set. In the back, you see the car going by. <laughs> uh, we're also trying to, t oh, this is a picture um, that sort of represents that we sort of get a lot of viral attention if people find interesting stuff uh, on Street View and send it around. This is one of my favorites, a Japanese superhero uh, that we call taking a nap. Um, <laughs> And we're also taking uh, it off the road. Uh, this is our off-road vehicle. Um, it's just a, a little bike that we can take to places like Stonehenge and other interesting places that you usually can't go by car. So um, th this approach of going a bit deeper and getting more, more data, more, more resolution, also works with our users, of course. So here is a bike map of Boulder, a very outdoorsy city. And we asked, so we got some data of where the bike paths are. But as everyone who uses a bicycle, they have, you have very strong opinions of which roads are more suitable, less, which roads are less suitable for bicycles, apart from having bicycle pathways. So we asked our users to go to MapMaker and tag each road and how good it is for biking. And there's a lot of bike enthusiasts. So here you have a community of bikers who, who go uh, online and, and update the maps for, the, for everybody else. But if you're a business owner, you can do something similar. You can go on and just fix your address and so on. And we heard from many people that, well, they, got to, they used to get many calls on how to get to their place. That's no longer the case. They get almost no calls, except for when Google Maps is wrong, and suddenly calls go up. But then they go online and fix it and make it so that it's easy to find them, even if they're in obscure locations. Well, once you're fixing the map, you could also report real-world problems. 
So this is a site called Fix My Street in the UK, where you can tag a problem, and then they contact the local authorities and make sure it's fixed. So people will report potholes, they report uh, broken lights, and so on. And here's a graffiti. You, know, you could also argue this is art. So there's other people who go and map the art. So it takes, uh, keeps reserved. So here's a map of Banksy pieces, and it actually tracks which ones are get demolished or which ones get um, otherwise broken. And someone created a on, um, mobile application that you can walk around and find uh, murals, and they get an explanation of who did them, and what the history is, and so on, so to preserve them. And that's, again, mapping driven by a purpose that is uh, just to preserve art. Um, now, sometimes there's disasters, and like here is a fire in a forest near uh, Los Angeles, and people then immediately go online and create those maps where they collect all the information they hear from the police, from the radio, from neighbors, and so on. And then people track it and see where is the fire, is it approaching, do I have to get evacuated? They get this information from the radio and TV, of course, but, but that's a very visual way to do it. And it gets collected by users and updated constantly. So you see people always getting, coming together and mapping things around some purposes. Or uh, here's a map of uh, gluten-free eating in Montreal. Um, uh, if you have an allergy, you, that's an important, uh, it's quite hard to find good places, so you can collaborate with other people. And so this is another set of mappers. And again, we have users who have a motivation, who find a common cause, and then they go and map this little piece. They don't think of themselves as cartographers, but it's goes broader and broader. Uh, an artist, uh, C. Frank, he has a website where he asks uh, his visitors to go and follow the footsteps of their, their morning commute when they went to school um, and note down any emotion they have. And what's interesting about this is this, this is a really common place, nothing exactly noteworthy for most people. But if this person would draw a map, they would put this, uh, the, that, this place would be special, it wouldn't look like any, anything else. Uh, if this person would draw the map, they would have deep philosophical thoughts going into this little piece of map, and it's certainly a beautiful area, but it's, uh, it's special to them. So the map, your perfect map, the map that would be most accurate for you, should have uh, places that are special to you, special on the map. It should know potholes, so you can navigate better. That's sort of the equivalent of the early explorers mapping all the strong currents and things like that. It should, like, it's just daily navigation, and you go and update it. And indeed, uh, it will be a bit like the early explorers when they went and did a new tour. They came back with a lot of new information that was incorporated into the map. And then they took the new maps out and used them and then fixed the problems there. So every time they used maps, they actually go, went on created maps. And that should be the same in the future and will be. So I suggest you get to know your inner explorer since you will get to know him quite a lot better in the coming years. You will mark your little pieces on the map like the little creek that you wanted to go, that you didn't have time to go to because you want to go there next time because, we don't know, there might be Lake Victoria on the other side. Or um, you want to mark this little restaurant over there where the service was so bad that you felt we were stranded on a sandbank. And so you want to warn your friends <laughs> that you shouldn't go there. Uh, and things like that. So the map, the map becomes a living, reactive thing, uh, resonant to your feelings, to your interests. It will point out things that you should visit and it will, you will collaborate with other people. You will see what other people uh, are interested, are similar to you, that share your interests, and you communicate through the map. Thank you. <laughs>